This is the first of a series of screencasts, which sets out to establish an understanding of why we walk the way we do. In it, I'm going to consider the history of the subject and use this to establish an overall methodology. In the subsequent screencasts, I'll try and use this methodology to help us understand how we walk. By we here, why we walk the way we do, I'm referring to those of us who are reasonably fit and healthy, with no specific neuromuscular skeletal pathology or symptoms. Many people refer to this as normal walking. The word normal has fallen out of fashion a little bit because of the connotation that people who don't walk like this are abnormal. I'm not particularly convinced by this logic and we'll continue to use the word from time to time, but only in relation to the gait pack, not to the person. Given that most of us are paid to analyse how our patients walk, you might ask why it is that we're going to start off thinking about how we walk. Well, I think Vern Inman had the answer. This is him in the centre of this picture. He was the orthopaedic surgeon who was commissioned by the US National Research Council in 1945 to head a multidisciplinary team of about 40 staff to establish a scientific basis for the provision of prostheses to American soldiers who had lost their limbs in the Second World War. The first thing he invested his time in was to try and understand normal walking. In his words, it is obvious that any improvement, either in surgical and physiotherapeutic procedures or embraces and prostheses, must rely upon an accurate knowledge of the functional characteristics of the normal locomotor system. Given how common walking is, it's actually quite amazing how little we understand it. There are a variety of attempts in various textbooks to explain walking, but I'm not sure that any are convincing. Many of them are simply not biomechanically rigorous. Others are more rigorous, but are not clinically useful. If you've got time to go and read the standard textbooks with a highlighter pen, or pencil if it's from the library, try and mark passages that either don't make sense or don't provide a framework for how you assess your patients. You might be surprised as to how much of the book is marked. One of the most common approaches to try and explain how we walk is through what have become known as the determinants of gait. This is perhaps one of the most well-known outputs of Inman's research project, although, as we'll see, it hasn't necessarily stood the test of time well. In it, Inman and Howard Eberhardt, an engineer, developed a sequence of models which get successively more complex. They started off with a very simple pattern of walking, which they called a compass gait. This only requires flexion extension of the hips. They then showed that by adding in pelvic rotation, stance and then swing phase knee flexion, and finally ankle and foot movement, that it is possible to build up a model that looks more and more like normal walking. They claimed that each step led to a successive smoothing of the trajectory of the centre of mass, and that this reduces the energy cost of walking. Thus, by building up the model, we build up an understanding of walking. This is based on one fundamental principle, that the energy cost needs to be minimised. This approach is inspired, it's elegant, it's persuasive. It's been repeated in almost all of the major textbooks. Unfortunately, it's also wrong. Over the last 15 years or so in biomechanics, there have been a large number of papers debunking the determinants of gait. These three papers, show that the named determinants don't actually affect the way the centre of mass moves in the way that Inman and Eberhardt suggested. These two papers highlight the critical importance of heel rise in determining the centre of mass trajectory, which wasn't one of Inman and Eberhardt's original determinants. These two papers show that using biofeedback, you can train people to walk with negligible excursion of the centre of mass. But if you do that, those people actually tend to walk with more energy than if they walk normally. This is a little bit unfair to Inman and Eberhardt, who never actually said that the excursion of the centre of mass needs to be minimised. What they actually said was that the trajectory needs to be smooth, which is quite a different concept. It was later workers that misreported the work to focus on the excursion of the centre of mass. The final paper is a review paper, which is probably the most authoritative case against the determinants so far published. So what went wrong? Well, I think there were two problems. The first is that Inman and Eberhardt assumed that one criterion, that the trajectory of the centre of mass is smooth, is sufficient to explain all the features of human walking. 
I don't think life is that simple. It would be nice to identify a small number of criteria, but I don't think we're going to get away with just one. The other problem, which has dogged science since at least the time of Plato and Aristotle, is that they only ever thought about the problem. Despite all that data that was collected in a gate lab that was at least 30 years ahead of its time in Berkeley, they never chose to test the hypotheses against any real data. What I'd like to do is try and capture the persuasive elegance of the determinants of gate, but in a manner that is biomechanically rigorous. The first stage would be to identify the requirements of walking. What it is that we need to do to walk successfully. There will be more than just the one that Inman and Eberhardt used. We're going to start off with a simple model, probably the same model as Inman and Eberhardt, and we're going to add in complexity in small steps that we understand. After each step, we're going to test the model's predictions against our data to ensure that it is valid. We'll then keep on adding complexity that we understand until our model moves in the same way that we do when we're walking. If we've started off with a very simple model and ended up with a full complexity of human walking, and we've understood every step on the way, then I think we can justifiably claim that we actually understand walking. This approach may not be quite as simple as the determinants of gait. It might not be quite as elegant, but then it won't be quite as wrong either. I've suggested that one of the problems of the approach of Inman and his colleagues was that it was naive to assume that there is just one criteria which can be used to describe all of walking. This, of course, leads on to the question, just what are the requirements of walking? We can take a historical approach to this as well. Inman wrote a book on the basis of what he'd learned with Henry Ralston and Frank Todd. In it, he identified two requisites of walking. The first was continuing ground reactions to support the body. The second was a periodic movement of each foot from one position of support to the next in the direction of progression. The first certainly seems appropriate. The second, though, sounds a little too vague to be useful to me. Jacqueline Perry also had a go. She came up with four locomotive functions listed here. Stance phase stability is probably referring to the same thing as Inman's support. Support is probably a better term though. Energy consumption is also obviously important. I'm less convinced by the term propulsion. During steady state walking, in which the average speed over the gate cycle is constant, there isn't actually any need for propulsion over that gate cycle. Newton's laws state that propulsion will only be required if the person is to speed up to accelerate or to slow down to decelerate. I prefer not to use the term shock absorption either. Most of us place the foot on the ground in such a way to avoid causing shock in the first place. I think shock avoidance would be a much better term than shock absorption. Jim Gage developed Perry's ideas a little further. He maintained stability in stance and energy consumption, but dropped propulsion and shock absorption. In their place, he added clearance in swing and adequate step length. He also added pre-positioning of the foot in terminal swing. This last term was heavily influenced by his experience of children with cerebral palsy, where the positioning of the foot during this time is critical. It's not obvious that this is so important for other patient groups, though. Notice that Gage saw these as prerequisites of normal gait. In 2009, I was asked to deliver a number of lectures on why we walk the way we do at the Melbourne Gait courses. It is those lectures on which this video is based. Gage's prerequisites had always seemed rather ad hoc to me, and I gave myself the task of selecting my own. After a couple of months of thinking about the issues, I came up with my own list of five. But when I actually sat down and compared them, I found that four of them mapped so closely to Gage's original that it seemed ridiculous to reword them. The one change I would make is to suggest that the requirement for pre-positioning of the foot in late swing should be seen as a special case of a more general requirement from a smooth transition from swing to stance. You also need a smooth transition from stance to swing, but as we'll see, that is much easier to achieve. The other issue I would take up with Jim is that these are not just the requirements of normal gait. They are the requirements of any functional walking. Restoring a normal gait pattern is unrealistic for many patients. 
Many have an abnormal but still functional gait pattern, and learning to recognise how they achieve this could be really important. It is only when we do this that we'll be able to distinguish between primary and secondary abnormalities, which we should be trying to correct, and compensatory mechanisms, which we should be aiming to enhance. But let's remember that the focus of this series of screencasts is on normal walking. Having established the approach we are going to use in this screencast, we'll now move on in the next screencasts to examine the basic mechanisms involved in walking.